All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today um, on our discussion about self-care while experiencing political stress and anxiety. Uh, we are so happy for everyone who's tuning in live that you could all make it. Um, throughout the discussion, feel free to leave us any comments that we can talk about. Um, and thank you so much for all of our members of the discussion who have joined me today. Um, just for brief introductions, joining us today we have Shannon Sofaleto, who is the Director of Health Promotion and Wellness here at DePaul and is the Interim Director of University Counseling Services. Shannon is a licensed clinical counselor and dance and movement therapist with over eight years of experience in higher education and administration. Her work in the area of health promotion began in the area of suicide prevention and grew quickly into all areas of health and wellness. Thanks so much for being with us, Shannon. Next, we have Leslie Waltlin. She's an assistant dean of students at DePaul University. She received her graduate degree from DePaul University College of Education and is currently completing a PhD in sociology, focusing on higher education and gender. Thanks so much for being with us, Leslie. Next, we have Ariel. Ariel has worked with students from all over the world, beginning with her work as a student coordinator in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and now as a graduate assistant for the Office of Student Involvement, mainly supporting DePaul's Student Government Association. She is also in the Clinical Mental Health Counseling Program and has dedicated many years to working in mental health. Ariel has worked with clients who suffer from a wide range of mental diagnosis, such as trauma, anxiety, and depression. Thanks for being with us, Ariel. Uh, we're gonna talk about our student reps who are here today. So we have Marcus, who is a 30-year-old Air Force veteran and a DePaul senior majoring in journalism. He's a cabinet member of SGA and heads the nation and world section of the DePaulia, our student newspaper. He is joining us from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, Lisa, huh? Thanks for joining us, Marcus. Our second student rep is Misa, who is currently a junior at DePaul studying education. He is SGA's chief of staff and serves on our ad hoc committee for mental health. His work as an RA has made him especially passionate about talking with students and meeting their needs and concerns. Thank you so much for being with us, Misa. Um, and finally, I am Francesca. I use she, her, her pronouns. I am a senior at DePaul. I'm majoring in international studies with a minor in Spanish, and I am serving as temporary chair of SGA's uh, mental health committee. And I am just so excited to be able to talk with you all today on November 2nd, um, the day before a really, really uh, important election. So I'm so glad. And we're gonna get started here um, with just like really honoring the space that we've come to, um, especially if we're talking about mental health, I think it's really important that we um, create a space where we're checking in on ourselves and also checking in on each other. So I'm gonna invite everyone who's watching and also the participants here um, to just take a moment um, to do a breathing exercise and then we can go around and say, you know, just from a scale from one to 10, 10 being amazing, one being not so great, um, how everyone's feeling. Um, and I think that will be really important so that we can start in this space being very aware of ourselves and each other. So um, if you all wanna join me, I'm just gonna count down. We're gonna breathe in for three, hold for three, and then exhale for three. And then we can get started. Does that sound good? Okay, awesome. So let's, if you want, I'm gonna close my eyes, but however you feel comfortable. And let's breathe in, one, two, three, hold, one, two, three, and exhale, one, two, three. Amazing, uh, thank you all so much for doing that with me. Um, let's just go around, we can start with Shannon. Um, so just give us, how are you feeling on a scale from one to 10? I feel about a seven, eight, which okay. I was pleasantly surprised about. <laughs> so yay. <laughs> energy, okay. Things like this energize me. I'm really excited to just to be able to be here. So thank you. Amazing. We're excited to have you. Um, okay. How about Misa? How are you feeling? 
I'm at a four or five right now, maybe a little, probably a four. Just things are very stressful right now with school, the election, and just so much, so much is happening. So it's all very nerve wracking. Yeah, and I think a lot of folks watching this would agree with you. So hopefully by the end of this, we can get you up a little bit. But if not, that's okay too. Um, Ariel, how are you feeling? Hello. Um, I'm good. I'm feeling like a, probably like a six or seven. I'm feeling better after. I love a good breathing exercise. Um, it's always really grounding. So I'm feeling better after that. So thanks for having me. Yeah, so glad to hear it. Uh, Leslie, how are you feeling? I'm feeling a six or a seven. Okay, that's solid. I like it. These numbers aren't bad, everyone. I'm feeling good. And Marcus, how are you feeling? On the surface level, I'd say I'm a good solid six. Okay, I can take that. Um, and yeah, for me, I actually am feeling like a seven today, which is the first time in a very, very long time. So I'm very happy to share that energy with all of you who might need it. Um, and yeah, so I'm so glad we all checked in. Make sure that you're checking in on your loved ones and yourself. Um, and I think we're just going to get started by kind of talking about why we're all here, which is tomorrow, November 3rd, elections of 2020. Um, and I wanted to ask everyone, you know, why is this election season standing out? Um, whether it's in your work that you do in the university with students or in your own personal life or just what you're seeing um, around you in the world, you know, what particularly for you is like the most standout thing about this election? Um, I already have mine on mine, so I can start us off. Um, for me, this election is so important and, in my opinion, the most important of my life so far because uh, I think um, sort of like, you know, consensus reality is at stake. Uh, in my opinion, the, the two ends of the political spectrum are um, kind of one, one, one is creating so, sort of a different reality that I, I don't think um, coincides with, with, you know, objective truth, if there is a thing. Um, and, uh, you know, so many of the big problems in our society and the world right now require us agreeing on the same set of facts and truths. And this election, I think, is kind of a harbinger on whether we can do that or not. Kind of heavy. Um, I don't know who wants to go next or I can popcorn. Maybe Misa. Thank you, Marcus. Um, I think there's many things in this election stand out. And if we look historically, elections are usually known for one significant like significant trade and I think this this one is going to be known as the pandemic election um and seeing that a lot of my friends my family myself have been heavily influenced by 2020 and um we've been very negatively impacted when it comes to a very important election like this where we have two um people who are advocating for very different things it's a little nerve-wracking knowing that after tomorrow we could be in a much more worse situation than what we already are and that the things that we care about so much and the things that we want to happen may not happen. So um, I think that right now, what makes this election a lot much more significant is that a lot of more people are writing on this election than what it normally might, might have been. Now pop on over to Leslie. So certainly, you know, every election, I look at both through a personal as well as a professional lens. So personally, you know, I, I have a great deal of privilege in my life being a, a cisgendered, able-bodied white woman, um, but I'm also a member of the LGBTQ community, right? So this election definitely has some salient elements in terms of different civil rights for folks within communities that I hold identities to, as well as for other individuals who are marginalized, right, and historically so. From a professional lens, 
I'm really concerned about wealth inequity and health disparities. And definitely at this time with the pandemic, we're seeing an increase in that, right? So it's more difficult for folks to get health care and mental health care. We're also seeing increasing numbers of folks maybe struggling with food insecurity, housing insecurity, and, and things like that. So for me, I'm really looking at politicians locally, as certainly at the presidential level, who are addressing some of these concerns and have real plans to do that. And that's making this a election feel heavier. A bright spot in the election is we're seeing record numbers of folks your age turning out to vote and really doing a great job utilizing social media to educate others and rally folks to get involved. So that maybe is keeping me at that six or seven, like I said earlier. <laughs> Otherwise, without the works of young people, I'd probably be at a three or a four. Um, so there's bright spots in this election too, but it certainly is stressful. Popcorn. Oh. New popcorn to Yes, to Shannon. That's what I was going to do. Yes. <laughs> I would like to be voted in to popcorn next after Leslie, because that's a, a really great uh, segue to many of the, the same thoughts that, that I was having thinking about. This is a, I had a colleague describe just this time as just the perfect storm of so many things happening all at once and swirling. And certainly um, what I think is causing a lot of stress, added stress and anxiety for 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 many people is uh, what we can and can't control. The pandemic has added a lot of out of controlness um, to our lives. That's very hard and amplifies so much of what was already hard. Um, and, and then now the elections layered on, on top of that. With that, as Leslie's talking about, there's pieces we can control with voting and things like that. And a lot of the things that you all as students are doing, I totally agree with, agree with Leslie on that giving me inspiration and hope and all of the things to, to carry on this important work. Um, from my vantage point, looking at uh, students' mental well-being, uh, certainly the election is part of that mix um, where it's 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 really been difficult uh, from a well-being standpoint. Um, so wanting to support students through that is also giving me a lot of sense of purpose uh, through this time. And I know many of us at DePaul who are working through this pandemic and, and through this election period and holding on to our work because it's really important to us to, to be able to do it during this time for students. Um, and I would say personally, um, I, I mean, I consider myself a relatively new mom. I have a four-year-old, and um, uh, I, I, I never have had the chance to see an election through the eyes of what you're preparing for your child, and so that's been um, a very new lens for me and a very different way to look at the the, the election um, as well. So, um, Ariel, you next. I am. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, similar to what Shannon said and what many of you guys said, um, you know, I feel like, of course, there's the partisanship is at, at all time high and it just, you can really feel like the stress and the anxiety of, of that. Um, but I feel like what, for me, what really makes this election season stand out is just the, you know, just as you guys kind of said, the context that we are living in, you know, the COVID and everybody's being stuck at home, the protests and our lives have just changed so drastically so fast. And it feels like there's so much on the line with this election. Um, and um, yeah, just like to see like, there's just a lot of policy changes that are up in the air. So it's, it's, it's definitely scary and stressful. Yeah, I'm just going to echo everything you all said, because, you know, I completely agree. Um, for me, it's my first time being able to vote in a presidential election. I voted in midterms, but not presidential. So for me, it's just like a very large responsibility, I feel. And I, I imagine a lot of young people feel this way. Um, and I just wanted to say as we move forward, um, so for the first time in 2016, um, um, psychologists uh, identified something called election stress disorder. It's not officially recognized in the DSM-5, which is like a dictionary for um, diagnosing patients with mental illness. But I think it's something really interesting to note that this is something that's very different and it's been changing ever since, um, you know, 2016. So I think thinking about that and understanding that this is a unique position and that hopefully it won't always, not every election will feel this way, right? Um, but, you know, moving forward and kind of talking about what those psychologists and mental health professionals have been looking at 
um, since 2016 and especially right now, um, I think we're just gonna go through um, some of like the main emotions and struggles that uh, people are dealing with surrounding political stress and anxiety. And I think we're gonna tackle each one, see where we're feeling on it um, and kind of see what practices people have been utilizing and what resources they can recommend. Um, so the first one is that there is a lot of anger and frustration in the air, um, whether it's with individual policies or um, you know who's making what decisions um, or whether it's more on the ground with um, fights for social justice or even just you know looking at the different groups that are supporting different people, um, it can be really hard to see like a lot of anger and, and it also causes a lot of frustration. So I wanted to know if you all can relate to this um, and what are some things that you've been doing to take care of yourself uh, when you start to feel yourself um, getting pulled into anger or frustration? I could maybe start if you want, <laughs> I'll volunteer. Um, Yes, I can relate to feelings. I can relate to having lots of different feelings and them changing fairly rapidly, um, which has been interesting to, to navigate. You know, um, I think that's important to know that that's okay. I think it's important to know that whatever feeling that you're having in any particular moment and is okay to have and you should have and you should be with it and acknowledge it and... Um, uh, do so with as little judgment as possible <laughs> and, and judgment of each other's right um, emotions and emotional state. And if it moves and it changes and when it does and how it does, I think the challenge is to stay with that and be, and be present with that. So we can um, get what we need as we try to navigate through it. So if I'm really angry because I've just seen something on TV that really upsets me, what am I doing in that moment to, to acknowledge that or be with that and meet that, that need in that moment? I think that developing the skills around that are most important. And um, so for me, that becomes, it, it is just that. It's like, wow. Ooh, that really kicked up something inside of me. And I know that because my heart is beating faster and I feel really angry and I'm, you know, having a hard time catching my breath. I'm the type of person who relies very heavily on the information my body gives me. So I will read that. And then I just try to breathe that. And if I need to speak that to somebody or, you know, tell my partner that, or walk away, I think, respecting that in relationships is, is important. So if that's with colleagues or whoever you're around, if you need a minute or you need to do something, hopefully communicating that and hopefully getting that need met if possible. So I also think we have to kind of work to create the spaces where that you can have that mutual respect. So if Leslie and I are in a meeting together and Leslie needs a minute, I said, great, take it. Okay. You know, or, and, and, and she's going to do that for me as colleagues. Um, so um, that's those are some of the things that I'm thinking. But for me, the challenge is staying, trying to stay present. That's why I was able to answer that my number is a seven or eight. I don't know if you would have gotten the same answer this morning or an hour ago, but that was my truth in that moment. And it's subject to change. And we can all kind of hold that qualifier up right now. I think it's an important one. Should I popcorn or does somebody would somebody like to speak? Maybe Misa, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think that with, you know, ever since the summer, there's been a lot of things that have, you know, been a little, that have caused a lot of anxiety. For example, a new member being added to the Supreme Court, um, all these other issues such as um, Supreme Court um, deciding whether or not to end programs like DACA that impact people who I'm very close to. And it's a lot more difficult when, you're going on the news or you're going on many different social media platforms and you hear things like LGBTQ issues may be taken away. And that's very scary. And that's something that, you know, again, we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. And we can only hope that those things won't happen. And one way that I try to sort of like get rid of that stress is, you know, I, I try to, when it comes to things like, you know, being a part of the LGBTQ community or being a product of immigration, I like to look at the things that have been accomplished by so many wonderful people or part of those communities that have allowed me to stand where I am now. You know, I look at what my parents were able to do. I look at what other LGBTQ icons were able to do to ensure that I could love whoever I want to love. And um, 
I think that from time to time it's also fun to like kind of escape through some form of you know reality tv or you know netflix or reading a good book and that's always fun but i think that during times like these as much as i try to you know get rid of that stress that stress will always be there even if it's 10 percent compared to a good 80 or 90 percent so i also try my best to like check in with other people to check in with my my like my loved ones my friends my family and i also hope that they're doing the same for me and that we're able to help each other and be a good support system for each other especially when again we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow we don't know what's going to happen in the next month or so and so i just want to ensure that whatever does happen even though i'm very stressed and it, there's not much that i can do to get rid of that stress if i can do the same for someone else and help them with their stress then that would that for me is a huge accomplishment now popcorn over to Aurel. Hi. Yes, definitely feeling the the anger and the frustration. It does seem like every day, you know, you turn on the news and there's something to be scared about, to be angry about, um, to be sad about. Um, and, you know, I definitely really love what Shannon said about taking that moment to just acknowledge how you're feeling. And sometimes just like taking that moment to recognize how you're feeling really creates space between you and those like overwhelming emotions. Um, and you're able to, yeah, like you're able to kind of separate yourself a little bit from it. And then also for me, just trying to channel my my energy into something a little bit more positive or productive. Um, for me, I I love to show up for my friends and my family. I love my, I like to, you know, work in my uh, my work and you know give back to my community. But for other people, it could be you know doing something creative. It could be exercising. It could be um, volunteering for your election. So I think just trying to, you know, use that, uh, trying to channel your anger and frustration to something maybe a little bit more um, positive and helpful. Um, I can add just like a different kind of perspective is my anger and frustration usually does not, I mean, news for sure, but I have been trying to stay uh, a little more vigilant of how much time I am watching the news but for me it's been in interpersonal um, relationships uh, because I think something that's special about this election is people are definitely um, much more out and like loud about their opinions and I think that that has caused a lot of strain on um, you know certain relationships uh, amongst like not immediate but distant family relatives um, and so that can be really difficult because you try to tackle those questions and those conversations. And I think that that can be really frustrating. Um, and for me personally, it's just about like not letting it take over in those interactions, but then like setting that side, like setting time aside afterwards, because I think you're going to find a lot of folks who might not be able to, you know, like have that moment right away. So just like, you know, getting through that interaction and then once you're home or once you're out of that situation, uh, figuring out something to do. Uh, for me, I like physical exertion. So I will either go for a run or do jumping jacks, you know, whatever space there is available. So part of part of my coping plays into uh, what you mentioned, you know, interpersonal relationships and everything. Um, I think I'm a bit of a unique case, though. Um, because actually the election has been a great distraction for me from some other things that have happened. I've had uh, a pretty, pretty um, devastating family tragedy recently. Um, and so the election has been, it's been nice, as weird as that sounds, to focus on that. Um, but even that can get stressful. So to distract myself from that, I, I've been recently making sure to keep connected to my friends and my connections at DePaul, SGA, um, my work at the DePaulia. I get a lot of my, you know, social needs in those, uh, in those places. So I make sure I'm giving myself that space, um, staying in contact with family as well. Um, the stuff that I've gone through has, has really shown me the, the importance of that. The most important aspect, the most powerful aspect of politics is, weirdly enough, the love and relationships that we have with each other, because that's the most important part of life. And without that, everything else falls apart. Um, I think politics has lacked a lot of that in the last several decades, and uh, it's probably pretty, pretty apparent to people who study it. 
Um, so I guess wrapping up my part to say, um, I've got a new appreciation for, you know, love and maintaining relationships, communication, friends, family, that kind of thing. Leslie, do you have anything to add or should we move forward? Okay, so we'll keep going. I think we've touched on a lot of things already, um, but I think one thing that everyone has noticed or has at least talked about um, is the idea of the news um, and kind of, I think one thing that I was reading a lot about is that folks get um, pretty overwhelmed with a lot of different news sources, a lot of different conversations. So I just wanted you all to reflect and kind of tell me, you know, um, where do you get your news from? Like, do you uh, have a podcast you like? Do you watch a bunch of different channels on TV? Do you have one or two? Um, if you're comfortable sharing or just like, are you on social media? Um, sort of that. And maybe in your head, you're, you can keep a tally and folks at home can keep a tally too of like, wow, I am consuming a lot of data or maybe I wanna consume more. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to hear about, you know, where you're getting your news, is it a lot for you, and uh, what steps do you recommend taking if you want to stay informed, but uh, it can be a lot. I can, I can uh, throw on my two cents. So I listen pretty, uh, pretty much every day to a podcast called The Daily. It's a New York Times podca podcast. It's 30 minutes long. I'm going to tell, it kind of tells a story about the most, some of the most important um, news things that are going on in the world. And I love it. It's very help. It's very helpful. And then I also listen just, I listen to mostly podcasts um, and then like a daily newsletter. But I will also tell you that one place I do not get my news is social media. I do not use social, I don't use social media at all. And it has been really great for my mental health uh, since I cut it out. And um, I think there can just be so much like hype and anxiety um, and sensationalism, you know, when you're scrolling through social media. So um, yeah, I have not used that to, for my news sources. And I can pop around to Leslie. I'm also a big New York Times fan. I listen to The Daily. I really like to follow NPR. Um, I want to recognize a lot of the news sources I use are moderate to progressive in that area, right? So I think it's important to get a balance of where you're getting your news. And there's definitely different places you can look at to see if the type of news that you're looking at is more progressive or conservative or moderate. And I think it's important to have that media literacy on where you're getting your news. But that is the, the type of news that I, I consume heavily. Um, there's also someone I follow on Instagram. She was a former White House reporter. Reporter. I think her name is Jessica Yellen. I could have the last name wrong, um, but her tagline is um, news, not noise, but she does a great job breaking down snapshots of different stories that are making the rounds through social media and kind of unpacking what's noise or what's actually newsworthy in those stories. So that's really a great person to follow. Um, and for election related news, 538 is another um, a source that I like to follow for that information. I am definitely someone who over consumes the news um, for sure. So I do have to check in with myself sometimes about, is this productive for you to be reading this at midnight? Probably not, you know, maybe you can look at it again in the morning. Like right now is not helpful. You're not even gonna remember every detail correctly. Um, you need to take a pause. So for folks who are thinking about consuming news, really my recommendations would be to the sources I listed, but also check your media bias, see where you're getting your news from and also check in as you're reading, you know, what is my max capacity and when do I need to take a break? And then go ahead and watch something, you know, mindless or, or take a walk, take a shower, a bath, work out, do something else to step away from it. And then maybe to Misa. Right, so similar to both Oriel and Leslie, every morning when I wake up and I'm just laying in bed, I'll pull up my laptop and I'll go on the New York Times, I'll go to the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, and uh, there's a, 
um, of very many different categories that I try to keep updated on, obviously COVID being one of them and seeing what's happening with COVID. Um, another one is international news. I feel like the U.S. takes a huge role with international affairs and we need to be able to understand that. I also like to um, keep a tab of what's going on in the community, what's going on with social justice issues, what's going on with, you know, environmental issues. I So I'll spend an hour on that and then what I tell, I also like to watch like, you know, videos with Fox and like um, Leslie mentioned when it comes to the election and the election season, 538 is a wonderful source. But I, um, unfortunately, um, like Ariel mentioned that she doesn't really um, get her news from social media. I've tried to not get my news from social media, but I found that I just cannot avoid it because all of my friends are posting that information and which is totally fine. And, you know, I'll go on TikTok, which you would assume is a fun app to use. But I, I, I keep scrolling, I keep scrolling, I keep hearing people be like, what's going to happen in the 2020 election? And it's just so much. Right. Um, so I tell myself that whatever amount of time I spend in the morning on the news, whether it be an hour or 45 minutes, I then have to spend an hour or 45 minutes whatever it is, um, on something I enjoy doing. So either watching a show of, um, watching an episode of a show that I'm watching or um, listening to some music that just relaxes me. So whatever time I spend on the news, I then balance that with something that I enjoy doing. But again, for my mental health is to ensure that I'm not being overwhelmed by the state of the world. Now popcorn to Marcus. Thank you, Misa. Um, so I am a journalism major. Um, so I kind of live in the news. I'm, I, uh, I have to consume it constantly and produce it as well. Um, so I am, you know, just always reading some kind of news from something. I, my alarm, uh, once I wake up and, uh, put my alarm to sleep or de deactivate my alarm, my phone, I have it set up to where it automatically starts telling me, uh, the big news of the day from Reuters which is just a wire service that, you know, aggregates other news sources. Um, sources I like, um, I make sure to check international stuff, Al Jazeera, BBC. Um, I like investigative journalism, independent stuff. Um, there is a newsletter that I think everybody should read. Um, it is called, it is uh, by this guy named Judd Legum. And it is called, actually, I'm blanking on it. I will Google it and, uh, let you guys know after. Um, so that, um, and then I, uh, I mean, New York Times, Washington Post, all the major stuff, but a lot of journalists um, are kind of required to be on social media. I tried to like just nuke all of my social media accounts a couple of years back and I had to come back to Twitter for journalism because um, just so much happens on it and it's breaking real time. Um, so some of my news comes from journalists and publications that I see on Twitter. Um, and that brings me to something that, that I wanted to bring up, uh, which is journalists have this term for, it's called doom scrolling. Um, it's when you're on Twitter and you, you start by opening up Twitter to see you know, what's happening right now. And, you know, you might see an incredible story, something that scares you like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening. And you read it and then you go back to Twitter and you keep scrolling and you just keep scrolling and you're scrolling and you're just like, it's like a compulsive. You're just looking for the next gloom and doom or the next, you know, maybe hopeful story, but just an endless cycle. Um, so that I try now that I've recognized that I try to limit it, you know, once I'm aimlessly scrolling on Twitter and not actively doing something with a purpose. I was once I recognized that I put my phone down, shut it and think about what I'm thinking about, think about what I'm doing, switch it up. Um, also, I have recently made sure to not scroll Twitter or like read the news while I'm in bed, either going to sleep or waking up. That's been really good. I highly recommend that. Oh, I just remembered the name of that newsletter is called Popular Information. You guys should look it up. Really good independent investigative journalism. I would like to say that Vargas's tips are fantastic. <laughs> I really like a lot of those. Those are really, um, really tangible things, you know, just the not sleep is, is been probably one of the top concerns uh, that we've seen is being disruptive and sleep affects so much about 
physical health and mental health. So um, I think that's both a good media consumption tip, but also a really good, you know, sleeping better tip and just not putting yourself into an, an arousal state before you sleep. You don't want to flood yourself with those hormones and things going on in your system that are that much harder to regulate. Um, so I just just wanted to piggyback off of that as like, there's some good neurobiology uh, in that in that tip right there that will really be helpful for your system um, and help you sleep and and, and relax. And um, so I don't know, for myself, I'm just trying to prioritize what I need to consume and why I need to consume it because some of it's very, very helpful for me, both personally and with also within the workspace. So um, it does help us make, make decisions and know and stay on the pulse of what's going on. Um, but really, I agree with what everyone's saying about picking and choosing accurate sources and balance and all of those things are important. Um, also trying to get information, um, not only of news, but also just accurate, um, like the latest studies that are coming out, you know, and making sure I'm getting those and staying up to speed. So we work with a, a physician, a DePaul works with a physician from uh, Amita Health that we work closely with. And I'm so grateful for that because then I can get the most accurate health information and read through those studies and stay informed in that way, which I know is a, a good and reliable source of information rather than having to go somewhere else. So um, and I also agree with mindless scrolling, too much of that. Um, so that's a good reminder. And um, I would like to dial in more to podcasts. I haven't as much, but I this keeps inspiring me to do that. I've heard about that podcast you were, you were talking about, Ariel. So um, I think I might listen to that. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, Shannon, could I ask you a follow up? Um, that's awesome that DePaul is like working with Amida. Um, and I was just wondering, um, once you all have access to those studies, um, do you like kind of post them in a, in a like, you know, a easy way for people to get the news or like, what are you doing? That's a great question. We do do that. Yeah. We make sure that, um, that we're passing along that most updated information and making sure that our health and wellness information that gets put out through the various channels is accurate and current and staying with all of the, the current, uh, trends or behind the scenes, we might be adapting things, uh, accordingly. So yeah, we do make sure that that is, um, that user, user friendly and, um, that we're putting out campaigns, newsline articles, um, whatever way we can put out information we, we usually do, but yeah, we definitely use those, those sources to do that. Thank you. Awesome. I think that's great, especially for folks who may not have access to like, you know, mental health or physical health officials. Um, I know like for me, my primary doctors are not where I'm living right now. So it's been like difficult to kind of filter that information. So thank you for that. And thank you to everybody. Um, yeah, also just wanted to say that sleep is a form of self-care. And so if you can dedicate yourself to at least eight hours, um, you're doing something really easy or, you know, your body does it easily sort of, um, and it can, it can really help you. So you don't have to think of everything as like, I have to buy a face mask or do these things, you know, um, simple things is like eating and sleeping and taking care of yourself that way. So that's great. Um, I think we've been touching on a lot and I think can I, I just add one thing really quick. I was yeah. going to endorse a program because it's a perfect time to do so. Um, health promotion and wellness has a refresh sleep program and it's exactly what you're talking about. So I didn't want to miss the opportunity to talk about it um, because it's getting a lot of traction. We have a lot of people across the university enrolled. So when you see refresh sleep come up, it's a guided, a self-guided program that goes out via email and gives super tangible tips um, about sleeping and how to improve um, your sleep. And I think it's one of our most popular right now because sleep is so hard. <laughs> you know, it's such a challenge right now, especially being on computers all day and um, not only that, but everything else going on. So I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I just thought it would be useful to, to know that that program is out there and receiving a lot of popularity right now. So you can always, the, the link is right there. You can check it out. Yeah, no, I'm actually so glad. Thank you for interrupting me because that is an awesome resource that I did not know was available to me. So I will have to check it out. Um, yeah, and also just in terms of social media, I have a good friend who um, I believe on most smartphones, you have an option to limit um, the amount of time you can spend on certain apps. 
And I have a friend who does that and he says it has been very helpful during this time. So if anyone else wants to do that. Um, but yeah, uh, if we're gonna move forward, I think now since we've been talking about those resources, Shannon, I think it would be a really great time to kind of talk about um, the idea that like voting is important, but what do we do when our vote doesn't turn out the way we want it to be, or we start to feel really insecure about what's coming up because, you know, maybe our voting didn't go as planned. Um, and I think that we should talk about um, some resources that DePaul offers in terms of where you can get mental health resources, where you can get information, um, but also just some resources that folks can use to kind of um, continue to be involved in their community. Um, because I think that, you know, even if the election doesn't go the way that you're planning, there are ways that you can still um, find some sense of security in other types of resources and work. I hope, I know that's a lot in one, um, one question, but just isolating it down to what resources DePaul has and then also uh, what resources the greater Chicago community has for folks after the election. Well, I really love the way you started to um, frame this because um, you really took a holistic thinking about it. And, and I think that's really important because there are a lot of ways, a lot of different and outside of the box sort of ways to care for your well-being. Like if it is giving back to your community or some other way of taking action that is meaningful for you and, and fills you or connecting with friends or clubs and organizations. We talked about that a little bit. So I think it is important to think about um, putting together a full package for, for yourself um, from many different aspects of, of your life and well-being. And um, so that's important. Uh, certainly, um, university counseling services and health promotion and wellness both are available on the individual support side, as well as offering lots of different programming, group counseling, telereach, outreach, health education um, are all available. And so I think looking at all of the different pieces and thinking what makes the most sense. I'm never a proponent of do one thing. I'm a proponent of look holistically across the board. And uh, my, my son right now is reading a book about filling up your bucket and how kindness to others fills up your bucket, right? And then when somebody does something not nice to you, it takes away from your bucket. I just encourage everybody to look at you know, being kind to others to fill up your bucket and also looking for things and resources that help you fill up um, inside that make you feel good right now. Know that absolutely UCS, Counseling Services and, and Health Promotion and Wellness are certainly here um, for, for support if people are really interested in um, that that one-to-one -one, um, support as an outlet for them. I also am aware that's not comfortable for everyone at every time. So that's why um, looking across the board at your resources is available. And I think popcorning over to Leslie might be helpful for piggyback there. So I don't know if you all have the link to share. I'll, I'll dig it out and, and drop it. But I know that the university has the web page with a variety of different programs that will be occurring across the next couple of weeks that we've perceived to have some type of tie-in to the election. Um, so some of them are communities of support for different students and places for folks to process. You know, the, the election has been hard. It's been a very polarized and divisive process. And the outcomes of the election will impact people differently depending on their social support network, their identities, their involvement in the process. So folks' needs are going to look radically different, right? One student might find that they just need to spend time in community with their friends or family or a student organization. And other students might really feel like they need some immediate care and concern. So certainly, you know, UCS, HPW, our office and the Dean of Students are great resources for students if they're feeling like they're in crisis or if they're worried about another student in an immediate sense. Um, definitely, we have lots of programs and activities for students that will be occurring across the next couple of weeks to help students who are just seeking general community and support. I think those are great resources. But something that is both a scary thought but also a comforting thought is that there will be work to be done regardless of the outcome of this election. 
right? So no matter who is elected as president or you know our local government officials, there is still work to be done around the issues that got us passionate enough to show up and vote in the first place, right? So I think there's there's some peace in knowing there's no one fix. Certainly we all have opinions on you know some options being much closer to our values than others, right? But I think that there's going to be work to be done no matter what. So students need to prepare for staying engaged in the issues that they care about, staying involved in their community, and identifying if they or a friend near them are starting to feel like they're in crisis and getting them connected to that emergency support where necessary. I also forgot to mention too, I mean, there are, there's university ministry if spirituality connects, you know, um, there's the, the identity spaces in the office of multicultural student success. So certainly even beyond those of us uh, represented on this panel, there are far and wide. And if, if you, if, people are needing to get access to those spaces, they can certainly work through my offices or Leslie's office too, to, you know, however we can navigate getting a student where they feel like is the best place for them. We are always committed to, to doing that. I think we have time for one more comment on this one before we move forward. So whoever has something to say. I'll just make another plug for interpersonal relationships i think that's where this all starts again um if your family is you know in a place where you can go see them or contact them um you know i i think that's the first first uh line of support and then your friends and um anything else you know of, of course university counseling services is uh is something that i'm i'm going to be making use of myself actually um and uh, if anybody needs help finding any of these resources, obviously we've had um, places mentioned already, but um, DePaul's student government organization, any students um, looking for resources, we'll do our best to try to point you in the right direction. Um, and if we can't find resources, we'll do our best to, to make one or you know try to solve the problem ourselves. Um, DePaul SGA has an Instagram account and we're on DHub. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think um, next steps, no matter how the election goes, still, it starts with our interpersonal relationships, you know, um, and you branch out from there to your neighbor, to your neighbors, your neighborhood. Um, the most local you can get, I think, is the most important. Um, so if there's, if your neighbor needs help, I think that's, that's who you need to help before you know, somebody outside of the city. And if you need help, hopefully your neighbor helps you too. Um, so yeah, I'm all about interpersonal relationships right now. Yeah, I think there's a lot of really good resources offered, but just, you know, start with yourself, um, get yourself to the place where you need to be. Um, and then I think moving from there, just remember there are countless ways to make your voice heard. And there are still a lot of, you know, institutions, a lot of checks and balances, a lot of things that you can hold on to um, for a little bit more security and a little bit more hope. Um, yeah, so we have had such a robust conversation and I know we didn't get to touch on everything, um, but I'm so glad that you all could join me in this discussion. Um, and I just wanted to close by talking to our audience a little bit. Um, you know, we obviously are people just like you, so we don't have a foolproof way uh, to avoid any type of stress or anxiety during the elections. But we do want to try and lighten the load and kind of let you all know that you're not alone and this is happening to so many people in so many different ways. So uh, what we challenge you to do, um, if you can do it, uh, is tomorrow is November 3rd. Everyone is getting out to vote if they haven't voted already. Um, and it's gonna be a potentially very, very unique day for you and your mental health. So what we want you to do personally is think of three actions that you can take to take care of yourself tomorrow. So whether or not it's limiting your time on your phone um, or you know, cooking a meal that really brings you joy and comfort, um, do those things for yourself and just try to make three things, three easy, simple things you can do to take care of yourself tomorrow. Um, look to a grounding phrase or idea to get you through the day. 
Um, and then think just about three people or three resources you can access tomorrow if you feel you need a little extra support getting to the day. Um, so yeah, make that plan for yourself and make it for your community too. Uh, if you're living in a household with more than just yourself, you know, um, maybe talk about a plan uh, to respect everyone's feelings and kind of let everyone have the space that they need. And then also make sure in a really like tangible way that your household has the supplies it may need um, if you're choosing to maybe uh, stay indoors for a little bit. Um, we don't know what this week will bring, so whatever you need, make sure that you yourself are getting it and also your community. Um, and then I just wanna plug a few more events like we all touched on. There's tons of resources that the university has um, for folks going through this election period. Um, most recently, uh, our Student Government Association will be holding two post-election discussions. Uh, the first is on November 5th uh, at 3 p.m. You can go onto dhub for the link, or you can also contact DePaul's um, Instagram for the Zoom link. And then we also have a second discussion on Monday, November 9th at 5 p.m. Um, both of these discussions are going to give you uh, a chance to do what we all did here. So just come, bring yourself, bring a friend, um, and just have a space to talk about what you're doing, and hopefully we can all work through this together. Um, I wanted to thank all of uh, my panelists, my members of discussion. You all have been so wonderful, and I am so grateful that um, we got to hear your perspectives. Uh, and then also a really big thank you to Natalie, who is our behind the scenes um, tech whiz who helped us put this live stream together. Um, this live stream will be posted to DePaul SGA's um, Facebook page and I believe our YouTube channel as well, um, if anyone else wants to rewatch or um, show a friend. So thank you all so much. Uh, I think we're gonna sign off, but if anyone has any closing thoughts, Go vote. You're loved. If you need to talk somebody, do it. All right. Awesome. Thank y'all.